Father, as we continue to come to 1 John, uh, to be awakened to the evidences of your grace in our lives that should cultivate assurance of salvation as your people, I pray that you'd help us to see this um, first uh, insight uh, into those evidences of grace and our repentance, and I uh, ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So what we've seen the past couple weeks um, is that we grow in gospel assurance, and gospel assurance, we're talking about assurance that we're saved, assurance that we have a saving relationship with God, that our eternity is secure in Him, that we are His people, that He is our God, our sins are forgiven, um, and, we, and we cultivate that gospel assurance by cultivating the evidences of grace, of His grace, in our lives. So the, the more we grow in our faith, in our love, in our walk with Christ, the more we're going to see that that growth that we are experiencing is, is produced in us by His grace. That's why it's an evidence of grace. Like we're seeing Him at work in us. And so we're asking, as we go through this book of 1 John, what are those evidences that we should be on the lookout for? What are the evidences of God's grace at work in our lives that we should be paying attention to, that should be giving us assurance of salvation? And this morning we come to uh, the first major evidence of grace that John addresses here in this book, namely repentance. Repentance. A very basic definition of repentance is just a U-turn. So just think of the, um, the traffic sign, you know, the white sign with the black arrow kind of doing the little U-turn. All right? We all know what a U-turn is, right? U-turn implies what? It implies turning from something, right? We're going in this direction, we've got to stop, and we've got to go the other direction. Okay, so we're turning from something, but also what? Turning to something. Turning from and turning to so the Westminster really teases that out and, and fills in some of the details for us. We heard the definition that the Westminster gives in the larger catechism earlier, in, or the shorter catechism, rather, earlier in the service. So you can look in your bulletin as I read it. Now, repentance, we confessed it a minute ago, is a saving grace by which a sinner, truly aware of his sinfulness, understands the mercy of God in Christ, grieves for and hates his sin, and, and turns from them to God, fully intending and striving for a new obedience. So you hear it there, right? Turning from, turning to, both of those are essential to biblical repentance. As the confession rightly puts it, both of those are evidences of grace. It is a saving grace that God uh, produces in us. And it's that evidence of grace that we're going to turn to this morning as we launch out into this study of 1 John. And I'm just going to take that as our outline. Just those two things, okay? The evidence of grace and what we turn from and evidence of grace and what we turn to. And I think in seeing that evidence of grace in your life is going to be a tremendous means of growing in your assurance that it's grace, and only grace that's producing that. Okay. So that's what we're going this morning. Let's start with what we're turning from, okay? Now, this should go without saying. This should go with that, but we're going to say it anyway, okay? Before we can turn from sin, we have to own the fact that we are sinners. That makes sense, right? In order to stop and turn around, you have to realize that you're going in the wrong direction, Okay? And that's what John's getting at here. Look at what he says. He says, God is light. So he's going to use this, these metaphors throughout 1 John. There's one of them, light and darkness. Light referring to God's purity and holiness. Darkness referring to our sin. Right? So God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, that walk is like conducting our lives and living in this way. In darkness, we lie and we don't practice the truth. So that's a denial, right, that sin affects our relationship with God. That's a denial of that. 
It's, it's saying that, you know, it doesn't really matter that God is light. Darkness can just walk right into his presence and enjoy fellowship with him. No problem. I don't know if you ever tried this or not. Try mixing light and dark next time you have a chance. Go into your room, flip the light off, and try to mix light. And you can't do it, right? They're antithetical. They're opposed to one another. They're opposites. God is light. Sin is darkness. And they don't work together, right? They don't, they don't mesh Right? So this is a denial that sin affects that relationship, saying, yeah, God's light, but I can just live however I want in darkness and have no problem with fellowship. So that's not true. And now look how he, he unpacks that. Verse 8, right? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Okay? So there's the first claim that we have no sin. All right? But there's another one in verse 10 slightly different. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You see, that's a denial that we have sin that affects our relationship with God. First of all, we start out by just denying that sin matters, but now we're granting that sin matters. We're just denying that we have any. You see what's going on there? And did you catch the difference in verses 8 and 10? There's a, there's a slight nuance but an important one in verse 8 he says we have no sin that's present tense some were willing to acknowledge perhaps past sins but not present sins that used to be me I used to be a sinner I'm no longer a sinner I no longer commit sin okay verse 10 is a little different though it says we have not sinned that's past Okay, with some present ongoing results. So some refused to acknowledge any sin at all, past or present. It's a fundamental denial that we are or ever were sinners. This is the view that people are basically fundamentally good. You hear this all the time. When people hear Christians talking about how we are sinners to the core, right, This is the opposite of that. We're basically good. We're fundamentally, essentially good. That's the view being articulated in verse 10. And I think our biggest temptation, I think really is the former. I think for us in this room, or if you're listening online, if you have some connection with the Christian church, I think most people within a church uh, setting um, have a harder time with the former. Right? They, They don't tend to deny that we've never sinned. Okay, they would generally own that. But you do find some Christians who believed that although they used to sin, they have now entered into a state of sinlessness. That's, it. That's an, a view called Christian perfectionism. We used to be sinners, but now we've gotten past that in life. We've had this kind of catapult of, of uh, growth, and now we are plateaued. All right, Now we are walking in sinlessness. We've sinned in the past, but we've achieved this state. That's called Christian perfectionism. Still others may not go that far. Now this one is more, I mean, Reformed Christians do this. We don't go that far, but we get pretty close to that view. They won't deny that we're sinners, but neither will they acknowledge when they sin. Sometimes that's because they, they know something is wrong, and they just won't let go of it. So they won't own up to it because they want to hold on to it. Sometimes it's just pride. Not owning up to our faults. We, we, you know, we see this all the time in unresolved conflict. Right? Where, where, where one party will dig their heels in and they will not budge. It's a barrier to repentance with others. right? Uh, it's a Barrier to repentance before God. And so the Apostle John is rejecting all of those aberrant views. Christian perfectionism, just stubbornness in the Christian life. A refusal to own our sin, both generally and specifically, is evidence of an absence of grace in our lives. Because grace, think about it, grace by definition exposes sin. 
by definition, awakens us to the reality of sin, not just out there, not just conceptually, but here. Grace enables us to be honest with who we are. To be honest about what we do and what we think and what we say, even how we feel, even in our dispositions and affections. It takes the work of the Spirit of God to bring down walls of pride and to soften hearts to see our need of repentance. Our need of forgiveness. Our need of Christ. Which is, which is why John not only gives the negative, okay, but he gives the positive alternative to refusing to own our sins. Okay, look at what he does. Verse 7. He says, if we walk in the light, if we, if we live our lives pursuing light, like exposing darkness in our lives and pursuing light in our thoughts, our speech, our actions, our very affections, if we conduct our lives in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. And according to verse 9, pay close attention to this, because you might hear verse 7 and say, well, that must mean I have to perfectly obey and never sin in order to walk in the light. That's not what He means. Verse 9 tells us that walking in the light includes owning and confessing our sin. See what he does? Look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, as we walk in the light, and as we sin walking in the light, what are we going to be doing as we walk in the light as sinners? We are going to, verse 9, be confessing our sins. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, pay close attention to verse 9. He doesn't say sin, singular. What does he say? He says sins, plural. It's not one sin. It's just not, not the sin nature or just generally sin. It's not like one confession that we do whenever we enter the Christian life. We're going, to con- we're going to confess our sin when we become Christians. We'll repent then, and then we don't need that anymore. It's not what he says. Repentance is not something we do just once. Luther said that repentance is all of life. All of life is Repentance. It's just like how Jesus teaches us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. We do this every week, don't we? Well, Jesus teaches us to do it every day. And what do we do every day when we pray? How did Jesus teach us to pray daily? What did he include in the Lord's Prayer that should teach us this concept? Namely, forgive us our sins, right? As we forgive others who sin against us. So we're going to be sinning against each other horizontally, right? We're going to sin against one another in our families, in our marriages, with our kids, with our coworkers, with our, but we're chiefly sinning against God daily, which is why daily we need to confess those and we need to be seeking renewal of the fellowship that we enjoy with our Heavenly Father. Grace is what produces that in us. Grace is what helps us to own our sin and to confess our sin, not just generally, but specifically and daily. Listen, all of life is repentance. Let's say that together. All of life is repentance. That's what he's getting at here. But more than that, notice what he does. More than that, grace is not just what helps us own sin and and confess sin. Grace is what helps us actually turn from sin. Look look at what John does beginning in chapter 2. So he just spends several verses at the end of chapter 1 telling us to stop denying that we're sinners, right? Stop trying to cover your sin, deny your sin, own it. That's his point, right? Own your sin. But 
that doesn't mean that you can stay in your sin. See that? Look at verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you. Why? So that you may not sin. Don't misunderstand his point in chapter 1. By getting us to own sin, confess sin, acknowledge sin, be clear and comfortable with the fact that we are sinners daily. He doesn't mean, and then you revel in that. And then you're content with that. There should be a holy discontentment with sin. There should be an awareness, not just that we are sin, but that we have to battle it. It is not enough simply to confess sin. We must endeavor to stop sinning. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, period. It doesn't say, I'm writing these things to you so that you can sin a little bit, right, on the little things, just not the big things. He's not saying, I'm writing these things to you so that, you know, the, the, the big sins you'll avoid, but the respectable sins, we're not going to pay attention to those. So that you may not sin, period, in any way. Just stop committing those sins. That's what he says. In order to see God's grace in our lives, you know, we have to do both. We have to not only reckon with who we are as sinners and what we do daily as sinners, we have to own that, but we also have to, by his grace, battle those sins. We have to endeavor to stop the rebellion to stop walking in darkness, to start pursuing all the more walking in the light. Now, again, does that mean perfection? We just said that doesn't mean perfection, right? We've just said that, right? The bar is no sin. We're never going to hit that bar this side of heaven. When Jesus comes back and we get glorified and this nature is eradicated, we have a new heaven, a new earth, and glorify, then we're not going to sin anymore. But we're just not there yet. But we don't lower the bar. We don't say, well, just because we're going to sin, then we'll, we'll, we'll try to like do like 50% no sin, right? It's 100%. It's always going to be. That doesn't mean that we're going to meet that standard every day of our lives as we walk. But that's what we're shooting for. So we just saw it doesn't mean perfection, and we're going to see it again here in just a second. It doesn't mean that we do it perfectly, but listen, it means that we endeavor to do it genuinely. There is genuine effort on our part brought about by the Holy Spirit's grace that we not only acknowledge sin, confess sin, but we seek to stop sinning so that we can have greater joy and fellowship in the light. So that's how grace evidences itself in what we turn from. Is that clear? That's what he's teaching us. That's grace evidencing itself in your life in the things that you turn from and what you own and what you confess and what you cease and battle. But now look at what we turn to. Okay. Now we have to see the other side of the coin. And here we need to be just as clear about what we're turning to as we've been about what we're turning from. And there's a reason for that. There is a a pseudo-repentance. Because you know what that word means? It means fake, right? It means pretend. It means it's almost genuine, but not quite. It looks like what the Bible calls repentance, but it's not quite that. It's a fake repentance. And there's something that makes it fake. There's something lacking that makes it genuine. What makes it a pseudo, a, a, a so-called repentance, is evidenced in what the person turns to. So unrighteousness is really easy to see, right? Because there's no turning at all. There's, there's no turning from sin. Like sin is life. Christ isn't anywhere on the radar. We're not even making an, a, a movement. Like, it's the straight arrow, okay? 
one, uh, one-way street, no U-turns. That's unrighteousness. But there's something that looks like repentance, but it's not. It's called self-righteousness. Self-righteousness looks a lot like genuine biblical repentance because there's a turning from sin, okay? There isn't like, that's wrong, we shouldn't do that, and we're going to stop doing that, okay? So it looks like genuine repentance because of what you're turning from, but it's not genuine repentance because of what it turns to. It might turn from sin, but it's accompanied by a turning to self. That's self-righteousness. That's because the the self-righteousness don't turn from sin to grace. They don't turn to the sufficiency of grace. They don't turn to a person outside of themselves for the forgiveness of their sins. They're trusting in their repentance. They're trusting in the religiosity that they're offering to God. They're banking that they've repented good enough and and completely enough and earnestly enough in order for God to look at that and say, now now that's that's forgiven right there. They're resting in, trusting in the quality of their repentance rather rather than in the God who forgives repentant sinners. That's why it looks on the outside like repentance, but deep down it's, it's not. And that's what John's teaching us here. He's not teaching us to rely on, to trust in, to rest upon our repentance. He's not teaching us to turn to self. He's teaching us to turn from sin so that we can turn to Christ. So look at how Christ is all over this passage. Verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and our repentance cleanses us from... No, that's not what he says. Look at it. Verse 7. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Our repentance doesn't cleanse us. The quality of your repentance and your believing doesn't forgive your sins. That's not the basis of it. Otherwise, why did there need to be shed blood on the cross 2,000 years ago? This says that our repentance isn't what cleanses us from sin. The blood of Christ is. Again, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Right, We got that. But if anyone does sin, praise God for that, by the way, right? You hear that and you think, whoo. But then you immediately remember that, no, I am still a sinner. And so here's the provision for sinners like you and me. And it's right here. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's what we're turning to. Repentance means turning to Christ in all three of those things that it just said about Jesus. It means turning to Jesus as our advocate, as our righteousness, and as our propitiation. So let's define those so that we understand what we're turning to when we say we turn to Christ. As our advocate, Christ pleads our case before the Father. So you can think of it in a way, there's some differences we'll come to, but you can think of it in a way as like an attorney, like a lawyer, okay? You're in the courtroom, And you come before the judge, and you have somebody who stands and advocates for you, pleads your case, argues for your innocence, right? That's what they do. So you can think of it, but this isn't like any lawyer that you're aware of. This is not like any lawyer you would think to hire, okay? Because Jesus, as our advocate, okay, advocates for us not by making an argument for our innocence. He advocates for us by presenting all kinds of evidence of our guilt. So imagine you have a traffic ticket and you're really wanting to get out of that traffic ticket and you hire an attorney and all of a sudden, as the defendant, your attorney 
goes over, gets together with the prosecutor, and starts sharing, condemning evidence to the courtroom and presenting a case for why, yeah, you really did run that light. You wouldn't want to hire that guy. But that's what Jesus does for us as our advocate. He doesn't go to hide and cover and and obfuscate. He presents all the evidence that we are indeed guilty. That's what he does in the courtroom. And here's why you want that advocate. Here's why you need that kind of advocate. You need the one who is going to stand before the judge and present your guilt Because when he presents your guilt before the judge of heaven, do you know what else he presents? He presents himself. He presents himself along with it, which means Christ advocates for you with his, and look at the word, his propitiation. He's presenting your sin, but what is he also presenting? He's presenting this glorious word, propitiation. I want you to love and treasure that word. We talked about it in Sunday school. We're going to talk about it again now. To propitiate means to satisfy divine wrath and just judgment. To satisfy the punishment. You did the crime. You do the time. What is the time? Okay. In God's courtroom, it's what the Bible calls hell. It's God's outpouring of just constant, settled, unwavering opposition to sin and the one who commits it. When Christ presents your guilt before the Father and says his guilt deserves hell, along with that, what is he presenting? He's presenting his cross. And he says, and that punishment has been satisfied in full by me on his or her behalf. That's why you want an advocate who's going to be honest with the judge, who's going to bring your sin because when all of the sin is laid open and bare and the punishment is is declared due, we can have Christ who satisfied it and has paid it in full, right along with your sin before the throne of God comes His cross where each and every one of your sins has been paid for and is done. That's why you want Christ as your advocate. You want that kind of advocate before the Father who who brings His propitiation, who brings His satisfaction of the penalty for your sin in your place. And not just that, but look at where he goes. Right along with that propitiation, he presents his righteousness. The Bible uses words on purpose. Why does he mention Christ the righteous? Why does he bring into the discussion the holiness and perfection of Christ? The very righteousness that he brings into this courtroom setting as our advocate is not our righteousness. He doesn't come up there presenting, well, don't you see how all of these good things that he or she did outweigh all the bad? Folks, you don't have any of the good things. Christ gives you something better. Christ gives you his record of perfection. Every moment of every day of every year of Jesus' life was absolute perfection. He lived the life that we should have lived. The life that God demands if we are going to be with the light. And it's that life that he presents as ours. Sins belong to them, paid for. Righteousness belongs to me, given. 
When Christ advocates for you with his righteousness and his propitiation, he provides for you everything that you need in order to be right with God. So that, as we'll see in a moment, God can be faithful and just to forgive sinners. I love how Wesley puts it. He brings these things together in his great hymn, right? Depth of mercy, can there be? Mercy still reserved for me. Can my God his wrath forbear? That's propitiation. Me, the chief of sinners, spare? There is for me, or there for me, the Savior stands, shows his wounds, spreads his hands. God is love. I know I feel Jesus weeps, but loves me still. Jesus is advocating in this hymn for those who deserve God's wrath. He's advocating with his cross. He's advocating with his life. That's the advocacy of Jesus, and the result of that advocacy is this. We have his propitiation as ours. We have his righteousness as ours, and therefore, as verse 9 says, look at it again, God can be both faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. If Jesus Christ is not your advocate by faith, then you don't have either of those. That's what you turn to in repentance. It's, it's not turning to self. It's turning to Christ who is the advocate, the righteousness, the propitiation for everyone who turns from sin and turns to him in faith. That's John's point in verse 2. And that's probably a good point for us to close this morning on that very point. Because this passage really just it leaves us with those three questions, right? Three questions that only you can answer this morning as we are confronted with this passage. Number one, have you owned your sin? Number two, have you confessed those sins and turned from those sins, endeavoring to, to flee from those sins? And three, have you turned to the only advocate who can forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness? Because you need to see all three of those in your life. You need to see all three if you're going to see the assurance stirring evidence of grace in repentance. I mean, this is, this is how Wesley ends his, his hymn, right? So we'll end on this this morning. All right, there for me the Savior stands, shows his wounds, spreads his hands. God is love. I know I feel Jesus weeps, but loves me still. Now, incline me to repent. Let me now my fall lament, now my foul revolt deplore, weep, believe, and sin no more. Let's pray to that end. Lord, we need to see all three of those just manifesting in our life, that the, the realization of sin, the owning of our sin, confessing our sin, turning from sin, but not turning to self-righteousness. Not trusting in how well we offer repentance to you, but trusting in the perfect life of Christ, the death that he died for us on the cross, and his glorious resurrection for sinners. Help us to turn from sin, turn to him, and by his grace, the same grace that teaches us our need for repentance and grants it to us, carries us forward to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And as we see that more in our life, as by the means of grace we pursue that and we cultivate that in our lives individually as families, as a church, I pray that you would awaken us to see that the only reason we do any of that is because of the sovereign, sufficient, blood-bought grace 
of our advocate Jesus powerfully working in us. Deepen our assurance as we see it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.